That, that's live. Good evenings, oh, Melbourne. Uh, <laughs> hi. Love it. It's so nice to be here. We've been around Australia for the last eight days. We've had the time of our lives. It's been incredible. The whole way around, we've had a warm and wonderful welcome. We couldn't have had a better time. I'm going to ask you two things. Nigel said this morning you can hardly see. If you're going to take a picture, please do turn the flash off first, if you would be so kind. Um, I'm now going to introduce to you two speakers. One is incredibly charismatic. Um, the other one dribbles on a bit and is probably not quite as charismatic. But he, he does have two very important parts to his body. He's got brains, he's got balls, and he brought Nigel down here. So I'll give you Damien Costas. Thank you very much. I was here last December and I got a $50,000 bill from the police force for causing a bit of a stir on Racecourse Road. <laughs> no, you know what? It, it wasn't the police. It wasn't the police. They, they did a fantastic job. It was um, the minister, what's her name? Neville, the contemptible party. Um, <laughs> but it's very interesting because I, I, when I got here, <clears throat> I got a phone call from the Australian asking me for comment because apparently, and this has come up in the last two months worth of our discussions, but um, I'm going to get another bill from the police force uh, for the you know, 300 odd police that are here tonight. And what amuses me is that we've got AFL, uh, we've got the rugby, we've got Chelsea Manning, uh, there's something going on at Jeff's Shed, and apparently there's a protest at the library. Um, because in Victoria everyone seems to protest everything these days. Have you guys got a problem with library cards or something? <laughs> um, but no, um, I basically said the same thing I said um, the last time, and that is, uh, sue me. It's not going to happen. This is, this is uh, the last day of the tour, and um, it's, this has been 20 years in the making for me, um, as far as Michael Farage is concerned. Um, it started in 1999, just want to tell you a little quick story, uh, during the six months that I spent at university. Um, and it was really that brief, actually. Um, I was asked to complete this assignment for applied economics. Um, at the time, it was literally being taught by the most intolerable herd of steaming socialist idiots I've ever had the displeasure of turning my nose up to. Um, and it's, it's a lot worse now. Um, the assignment, which I actually intended to be my last, um, asked us to discuss monetary policy and fiscal policy and their mutually exclusive relationship as they coexist in a common market and cite the European Union as an example. Um, having become increasingly frustrated with the hypocrisy of modern education, um, and their relentless attempts at sort of pushing this regurgitative agenda where students need not argue the point, but just submit an agreeable paper. Um, I decided it was time to go out with a bang. So I started formally and I explained to the lecturer that the European Union was not only a flawed model, uh, but an accident waiting to happen. I argued that monetary policy and fiscal policy were not mutually exclusive, and that you can't set the value of a currency across 30 independent member states or with their own individual economies, their own individual taxation rates, and their own individual methods of tax collection. I actually use the example of the coach and four, but rather than the four draft horses, you've got yourself a Clydesdale, a Shetland pony, a donkey, and a mule. And you're asking them to all walk in the same direction at the same time, at the same pace, and carry the same load. Well, it's a nonsense, it's just simply not going to happen. Um, I suggested that the entire project would end in tears, and that the person responsible for its conception should be brought to justice and punished in a manner consistent with the severity of its transgressions. Um, and being my last assignment, I thought I'd prompt up some uh, suggestions for the form that uh, punishment might take. Um, naturally, creative corporal punishment um, that would be administered on a daily basis, preferably by a 300 pound German dominatrix whose arsenal may or may not include a midget dressed in latex and a small Macedonian goat. Anyway, you failed me. He told me I was a sick, twisted individual and I'd never amount to anything. And he was half right. So, you can only imagine this sort of 
bittersweet vindication I felt when the Greek economy collapsed a decade later for the very reasons I said it was. It was almost worth the six months my parents didn't talk to me for leaving university. <laughs> but something else happened that year in 1999. Um, and it happened on SBS. And for the millennials in the room, that's sex between soccer. <laughs> Um, a man named Nigel Farage was elected to the European Parliament and uh, before YouTube and Google and all that and I was up one night, you know, drinking, as I do, and I saw it and I thought, hello, he was elected with similar ideas to me and one objective, to lead the UK out of the European Union. And little did you know that this would be the shot heard around the world that would start a global revolution against the political and media establishment and God knows do we need it, people, seriously. Succeeded because, like all statesmen, he understands that politics is a contest of ideas and values and not an exercise in PR, and something that our current mob here would do very well to learn. Um, so I became a bit of a fanboy. As I say, this is 20 years in the making for me, and to be on the road with a man for five days has been just heaven. I'm fawning over him like a little girl on Harry Styles. <laughs> and being a good fanboy, I even made a video of my favourite Nigel uh, quotes, and I'd like to roll that for you now, if possible. You have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. <laughs> Virtually none of you have ever done a proper job in your life. Just who the hell do you think you people are? Who are you? Who voted for you? Big government. I can't stand it. from actually physically entering this hotel. And that's not very nice, but it's not going to stop me. We don't know you. We don't want you. You have no legitimacy in this job at all. This is the world's greatest leader. All I need is the right leader. That's, that's all we need. You know, when I came here 17 years ago, and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. You're not laughing now, are you? who stoked anti-immigrant sentiment with Donald Trump. You, as a political project, are in denial. What part of the word leave don't you understand? You are as stale and musty as a corked bottle of wine. Why don't you shut up and listen for a change? Have you ever punched someone? Oh, yeah. A very warm welcome to Mr. Nigel Farage. Off 
off with that. Have a go at Steve Smith, not me, all right? <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here. It's been a great week. Uh, I found in this country people are friendly, they are nice, you've got great service, you've got an amazing place that you live. And one of my key messages that I bring to you this week is look at your cities, look at your lifestyle, do not make the same mistakes we've made in many of our cities in Europe. But the, the protests outside, and we saw them in Perth, we saw them in Auckland, um, and we're seeing them here today in Melbourne. I think just worth thinking a little bit about what these protests are. You see, it's perfectly right and legitimate in a free, democratic society that people should be able to express their view, and that includes dissent. I've been dissenting in Brussels for nearly 20 years. But the problem, the objective that many of these people out here have today is not to dissent in a democratic manner. It is not to present an alternative argument. Now, what these people want to do is they actually want to close down debate. They actually want people like me not to be allowed to speak in these venues. Their actions are not just undemocratic, they are anti-democratic. And if you think about what those who went before us in two world wars shed much blood for, it was for the right of us in a free democratic society to have our say, to debate, to listen to different point of views, and we must stop this attempt to close down free speech with every fibre in our field. Now some of them, of course, some of them will be committed Trotskyites, committed to global revolution, no doubt mummy and daddy are paying all of their bills, but there we are. And of course the committed trots will hate me, because they see the European Union as being the epicentre of the new globalist project. And don't be in any doubt. What the globalists want, the European Union, Hillary Clinton. even the Malcolm Turnbulls of this world. <laughs> yes, yeah, close the bar, would you please? Let's not look at it like. What they want is they, want, they don't want nation states to make democratic decisions. They want these decisions made at a higher authority, at a higher level. The Trotskyites want one world government. They want one world currency. Some of them out there protesting me today will be committed Trotskyites, and you know what? That's fine, because actually it's going nowhere. My guess, though, is many of those out there are protesting me. And I say this because I met one of you earlier on this evening, and you said to me, I told my sister I was coming along to meet Nigel Farage tonight, and she said, well, why on earth would you go, go, want to go and listen to that horrible racist? And he asked her, have you ever listened to anything Nigel Farage has said, and she said, no, I don't want to listen to anything he's got to say. <laughs> and what you've got out there are a group of people who are being fed propaganda. They're being told that those of us that believe in the nation state, those of us that believe in proper border controls, those of us that are deeply skeptical of signing up to agreements like Paris, they're being told that we're somehow neo-Nazis. And where? Is this going wrong? Well, I'll tell you. We used to teach in our schools and hospitals, our young people, something called critical thinking. And critical thinking is you say to young people, here's a problem, here are two potential solutions, and you make your mind up which of those you think is the right approach to the problem. Now we teach young people, here is a problem of climate change, migration, or national sovereignty, and here is one solution that is good 
and moral and strong and correct and you must believe in it because it's backed up by science and here's another opinion which is evil, wrong and bad and should be closed down. I believe that what is going on in our universities in Britain, America, Europe, Australia and elsewhere across the Western world, I believe there is a cancer now deep within our university institutions. We are not teaching children in an unbiased ma manner on the matters of the day and I want to see strong government that says unless universities make sure that young people are exposed to both sides of the argument, all public funding stops. But there's a third reason why they're all out for first water I've run for weeks. <laughs> there's a third reason why they're out there protesting, and it goes hand in glove with much of what's happening in our mainstream media. You know, you've only got to turn on and watch CNN. <laughs> it's 24-7. Walls of wall. Am I interrupting somebody? <laughs> oh well, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Russia. Russia. You got it, Russia. <laughs> I said it's not this lot. 
quite right. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> it's Russia, isn't it? It's yeah. Russia, it's collusion. We now have the Mueller investigation in America, which is in day number 430, <laughs> and they cannot prove any Russian collusion at all. It has reached, in my case, such ludicrous levels that Hillary <laughs> that Hillary stands up and says that Nigel Farage is directly funded by the Russians. <laughs> oh yes. The Guardian newspaper says that I've been running memory sticks straight from the Oval Office from my friend the Donald. <laughs>
when the European elections were contested for the first time on the basis of proportional representation. It was the first time any national election had ever used this system. I wasn't necessarily at the time a fan of it, but I could see how useful it was. So I campaigned like crazy, I thought we could do it, and three of us from UKIP got elected to the European Parliament. I found myself that night at 1.30 in the morning, staring into the television camera, blinking, having never had any media training whatsoever, never done a live TV interview in my life, not quite sure really what to do. And the interviewer starts, he said, congratulations Nigel, which is a clue, it wasn't the BBC. <laughs> He said, congratulations, Nigel, you've been elected. You said you would. But next week, you'll go off on Eurostar to Brussels. You will get to your office. You will find a pile of invitations on your desk to lunches, dinners, champagne receptions. Do you, he asked me in my first ever live TV interview, do you think you'll become corrupted by the lifestyle? And I replied, and I still believe to this day it's the best reply I've ever given in a live interview. I replied, no, I've always lived like that. <laughs> so off I went to cause a bit of trouble and to have a bit of fun. And what I found over there, you know, I started off believing that the UK was a square peg in a round hole. I started off believing that because of our history, our alliances around the world, because of our common law system, and many other things, that we just were never ever going to fit the European political model. That the history of British exceptionalism had to come to the fore. You know, from Henry VIII onwards, we've always decided to do things our way and not their way. <coughs> but I went there believing that if the rest of Europe wanted it, that was fine by me. That didn't last very long. I realised within a couple of years that the whole lawmaking system in this union is bought and paid for by the big corporate businesses. That the more you regulate, the more you control, the less you allow any sector, men and women setting up their own companies to innovate and go in and compete. I realised within a couple of years that this project was far more than being just about trade and cooperation between neighbours. I learned that this project was actually, uh, without the consent of any of the people, to parcel all these different people up with their different histories, their different cultures, their different languages their different wines, their different cheeses, and to parcel them all up into one new United States of Europe, to militarise them, to give them a foreign policy, to give them a president, and to do all of these things without ever asking whether it's what people wanted. And I thought to myself, how on earth can Germany and Greece fit together in the same political union, rather like Damien's uh, thesis that he wrote 20 years ago. And so I decided, within a couple of years, that my mission was not just to fight for Britain to leave the European Union, my mission was to morph into a global revolutionary, because I want Europe to leave the European Union, because I love the individual countries. title MEP, with a position in the Parliament, the chance to speak, I thought I'd be able to reach out to a big audience on a regular basis, but it wasn't to be, because in many ways the big media organisations did their best to make sure that my message did not, on a regular basis, reach out to millions of people. And then, in terms of timing, I think I had an extraordinary piece of luck. It was called... YouTube. And so 
suddenly I was giving speeches in the European Parliament as the financial crisis began to hit. I said in one speech, if you look today at the bond spread between Greek and German bonds, you can see a major Euro crisis is happening. Not, of course, that any one of you in this room would understand what I'm talking about. A little example of how I was beginning to use YouTube to reach out to different communities. And then the big opportunity came, and it was that in 2010, after years of wrangling over a European constitution, which then became a Lisbon Treaty, we were told that Europe was going to have its first political president. We were told it would be a man of such authority <laughs> that he would stop the traffic in Washington and Beijing. Crikey, I thought. They must have somebody really big lined up. But who knows? Maybe it's even Tony Blair. I wasn't sure. <laughs> I'm in the office one day in Brussels. My assistant Jamie runs in. He says, they picked the president. I said, who? 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 Who's he going to be? He said, Herman Van Rompuy. I said, what? <laughs> I said, you, do you mean that Belgian geezer who was Prime Minister a couple of years ago? I mean, I worked in politics. I barely heard of this bloke. Yet he was going to be the big cheese. He was going to be the man that was going to turn the European Union into a global superpower. This was the man that I was convinced very few people had heard of. And the day of his big inauguration came, and the media were there, and it was a big event, and in I waited to see him. So I'd never seen him in the flesh before. And in shuffle, <laughs> this scruffy, scrawny little bloke, he hadn't bothered to cut his hair. The suit was 40 years out of date. He was wearing a pair of £9.99 plastic injection moulded shoes. And the bloke looked a shambles. When he got up to speak, and it was a 17 minute dirge. It was the dullest thing. It was dull as ditch water. It was awful. And I thought, this is just a joke. Well, then the other speakers got up, the leader of the Christian Democrats, to say what a great chap he was, and the socialists, a guy called Martin Schultz, who then went on to become perfectly preposterous, but anyway. And they all got up to say what a great guy he was, and the Liberal leader spoke and said it was a great moment for Europe, and a great moment for the world, and then it was my turn to speak. <laughs> of the ragtag and bobtail Eurosceptics. Little, lunatic, eccentric political parties, some of whom are now on the verge of taking government in their own respective countries. <laughs> when you stand up to give a public speech, and it's something I know, that many people are very scared of, very, very nervous, you know. People say, oh my goodness me, you know, my daughter's getting married next week, I've got to give a speech, my brother's best man next speech, I've got to, you know, give a speech, I've been promoted in my company. A woman says, I've got to give a speech, and people are really scared, they're scared of standing up and speaking. I suppose it's not really a natural thing to do. You've got to be sort of extrovert maniac to enjoy it, I suppose, but there we are. <laughs> My advice to people when they stand up and give speeches is for goodness sake, don't write down and read a speech. Because if you do, you're looking down there and the audience are there. So look at them, engage with them, have a couple of simple points in your mind. And if it isn't the family christening and you get one or two things wrong, don't worry. You know, within 20 years they'll forgive you, something like that. <laughs> no, the point is when you're speaking at the family christening, don't worry, even if you go slightly wrong, because everybody in that room is on your side. 
Now, when I spoke in the European Parliament in Brussels that day, <laughs> absolutely no one was on my side. And of course, if I wasn't quite sure what I was going to say, one word that was seen to be out of place would of course be used and they'd have me with it for goodness knows how long. But I knew roughly what I wanted to do. I wanted to say, no one knows who you are. You've not been elected. You've paid more than President Obama. You can't be removed. The whole thing is a farce. I don't know how to run Europe, for the looks of you, I wouldn't let you run a bath. That was the... <laughs> That was the basic plan. Anyway, I got up and I said, Mr. President, I said, we were told that when the new president of Europe was appointed, it would be a man who would stop the traffic in Washington and Beijing. And what we got was you. <laughs> I said, I don't wish to be rude, but anybody ever tells you that, it means the opposite, doesn't it? I don't want to be rude, but... Now, where the next bit came from, I still to this day do not know. I'd never heard the phrase before in my life. I hadn't planned it. I hadn't scripted it. It just kind of happened. I said, you have the charisma of a damn rag and the appearance of a low grade bank clerk. And the question I want to ask, the question we all want to ask is, who are you? I shouting out, saying disgrace, boo, throwing paper balls. I mean, there was absolute mayhem in there, and the President of the Parliament was intervening and asking me to shut up and sit down, and I didn't know what to do. I thought I'd just ignore the buggers and keep going and get down. So I kept on, and I finished up by saying, maybe the reason, Mr. Van Rompuy, that you want to abolish nation states, take away national identity and the pride in where they come from is because you come from Belgium. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm never quite sure whether the Belgian joke crosses over in Australia. Um, Belgian folks is a completely insignificant little place in Northern Europe. If ever you've been there before, you may well have forgotten by now. <laughs> the only place in the world where the pigeons fly upside down. I'll tell you why later in private. The... I mean, come on, name a famous Belgian. Tintin, they cry. Fictional character. Hercule Poirot, I get over there. Fictional character. And I reckoned on that day the chances of Herman Van Rompuy becoming famous were pretty limited to though as a result of my speech, his recognition rating in Germany doubled overnight. <laughs> he should have paid me as a PR guy. I suppose in some ways I should feel sorry for him because when you Google Herman Van Rompuy and his life, and you know he's been a bureaucrat and prime minister of that dumb called Belgium and various things like that. But actually when you Google this distinguished European politician's life, all you get to me at that speech. <laughs> speaker rose to condemn me because they were disgraceful I was, I behaved like an English football hooligan. <laughs> Terrible insult. And something must be done. Well, I'm not surprised that the call came through before very long. Would I report at nine o'clock the next morning to the office of the President and Chair of the European Parliament? Well, of course, I was there on parade, on time, nine o'clock outside the office and after my very chequered career at school 
this was something I had been quite used to. <laughs> the headmaster's office. You know the drill, don't you? <laughs> so there I was preparing, exercise book going down, <laughs> the back of the trousers, getting ready to get six of the best. Millennials, I'm sorry if this offends you. Uh, <laughs> if I hear a sort of involuntary sobbing breaking out of the crowd, um, I'll know why. Um, we used to live in tougher days and we did get one up at school. I'm not sure actually it was all that bad. But anyway, there we are. So in I go, I'm ushered in, and sitting behind the desk with a grave face is a man called Mr. Buzek, a former Polish Prime Minister, President of the European Parliament, and he beckons me to a seat. And my second major piece of advice for all of you tonight is if you're, in, if you're invited into an interview, and coffee is not offered, <laughs> you're in for a bollocking, all right? <laughs> so I sat there, he looked at me, and he gravely intoned, Mr. Farage, I'm asking you to apologise. He said, I want you to apologise to the European Parliament for bringing it into disrepute. <laughs> Now, of course, I should have just sat at the lip, really, shouldn't I? <laughs> but I said, well, you've been having a pretty good go at that yourselves over the last couple of years. <laughs> Not necessarily getting things off to the best of starts. He said, and secondly, I want you to apologise to Mr. Herman Van Rompuy and his family for the harm that you've caused them. I said, look, I'm just not having this. I said, the whole point about parliaments that elect people is opposition leaders attack prime ministers, backbenchers attack each other, people within their own parties attack each other, and sometimes fruity language is used. I said in the Australian parliament, <laughs> they call each other wanker. <laughs> None of this, by the way, was helping. <laughs> he then said, thirdly, it's the funniest bit of all this, he said, <laughs> you can't believe it really, but he said, I want you to apologise to the people of Belgium for insulting <laughs> for just taking the mickey out of this scrawny little so-and-so who came from Belgium. And then he tried one last pitch to win me over. <laughs> he said, Mr Farage, you can't criticise Herman Van Rompuy. He hasn't been elected. I said, I know. That was the whole point of the speech. <laughs> since then for fines, um, like all these countries, every, everyone's gone PC, haven't they? Everyone's gone health conscious. You know, we're not supposed to eat fatty foods or drink alcohol or... And smoking, of course, that was appalling. Like, smoking's been banned everywhere, hasn't it? Banned everywhere. Well, my office is a tolerant zone in Brussels for this sort of thing. <laughs> so, I, but I, as far as I'm concerned, the smoking ban doesn't directly apply to me um, or my staff. And I've now had my third warning from them. My third warning letter. If you're caught smoking again in the European Parliament office, we will send you a fine. And I've written back to say, look, let's cut out the middleman, let's make this easier, and put in place a monthly standing order. But I haven't... <laughs>
So there they all are, 30 or 40 of them, cameras flashing away, they're all shouting, have you apologised, have you apologised? And I said, ladies and gentlemen, please, a moment, silence. I said, I think there is a time in a man's life when he has to put up his hands. Admit he's got it wrong. Admit he's gone over the top. Admit he's caused offence. Admit he's made a mistake. And at times like this, it's right and proper to apologise. And I apologise now to bank clerks all over the world. <laughs> It led on to me suddenly going from being nobody to being known walking down the high street and a series of mixed reactions, but hey, that's democracy, isn't it? That's democracy. People knew where I stood, they knew what I was about. I was able to lead UKIP to do quite remarkable things, including in 2014, we won the European elections. We won a national election, something that had not been done by a party that wasn't Labour or Tory since 1906, and I'm immensely proud of having been able to do that. <laughs> and of course we got David Cameron. We got David Cameron into such psychological torture. <laughs> I'm convinced that he and Samantha still to this day stick pins in an effigy of me every night before they I'm going to have ruined his life, really, I suppose, but hey, there we are. It's a rough old game, isn't it? He promised a referendum, we had that referendum, we fought that referendum, we had the entire global establishment against us. Every world leader, including our Commonwealth friends, telling us we should not vote to leave. President Barack Obama. looking down his nose and sneering at us and telling us we go to the back of the queue. Well, thank God the Democrats have now gone to the back of the queue. We had David Cameron illegally spending nine million quid, sending a leaflet to every house in the country, telling us the dangers of Brexit. And we were told by everybody the Chancellor of the Exchequer said there'd be an emergency budget, taxes would go up, hundreds of thousands would lose their jobs, the car manufacturers would all leave the country, the City of London would all close down, and plagues of black locusts would descend <laughs> upon our land. And despite all of this, the British electorate stuck two fingers up to the establishment. of what Brexit was to mean over the course of the coming years. I didn't even realise on that night the extent to which the establishment would fight to try and stop it from happening. But it was interesting that on the morning of Brexit, a private jet flew from JFK Airport into Western Scotland, where a New York property developer <laughs> and decided he wanted to be in the United Kingdom. Trump wanted to be there for Brexit. Trump had called Brexit. Trump believed in Brexit. And don't forget, Trump's mother was a Scot. Trump feels. Trump feels. We've got some Scots in the audience, have we? We've got some Scots in good. I'm pleased they closed the bar. That's a good thing. Um, <laughs> Trump felt it. And it wasn't long before I found myself being invited to Jackson, Mississippi, by the governor of the state to attend a dinner. And the dinner would be Donald Trump and myself speaking to Mississippian Republican activists. The governor said, your Brexit message is the inspiration we need to beat Hillary and to beat the establishment. And remember, you know, nobody gave Trump a catch chance in hell, did they? Nobody. So I was only too pleased to go down to Jackson, Mississippi, uh, to meet, I, I'd never met Trump before. We tried to meet a couple of years before. I know his people have been watching one or two of the things I've been doing. 
Um, and I was thrilled to meet him. We had a great time. Um, he told this little dinner that he'd begun to call himself Mixed Mr. Brexit, but perhaps with me there, he better stop doing that. Um, and we got on very, very well. It was very good, very enjoyable. And then the exciting bit of the night came. Off to the basketball stadium with about 18,000 Mississippians crammed in there waiting for Trump to appear at a Trump rally. And I was really excited. You know, I'd been in Mississippi, I'd met him, I'd given my little speech at the dinner, I'd had a few drinks and enjoyed myself, and now I was going to sit in the front row and watch a Trump rally. I was so excited, and I was behind stage, Rudy Giuliani was there, the mayor, the former mayor of New York, remember him? The guy that massively cut crime with his zero tolerance policy, amazing guy, amazing guy. Uh, maybe your police can learn a thing or two when I've been reading in your newspapers. <laughs> uh, maybe the gang culture that appears to have um, taken root in Melbourne might get dealt with. Yeah. And mind you, at the same time, maybe the gang culture can learn a thing or two in Melbourne. Yeah. So Rudy was there, uh, and uh, Jeff Sessions was there, went on to become the Attorney General, and me and a couple of friends, very intimate crowd of people, honoured, privileged and excited to be there and it's 20 past 7, there's 10 minutes to go and everything is just great. And at that moment, Stephen Miller, who is now Trump's major speechwriter, Miller walks up to me and says, oh, the candidate would like you to speak. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no, we've decided that actually your message, Nigel, we've heard you earlier and speak to that group at the dinner. Uh, your message is so strong and so powerful and so helpful uh, that Donald is going to introduce you. I said, there's something funny going on here. At that moment, Trump comes over. Hey, Gene Nigel, well done, great stuff, great stuff, great stuff. He says, your message, great stuff, very powerful, very strong. You get up on that stage, I introduce you. You give him hell, well done, thank you. <laughs> So we've now got eight minutes to go. I'm about to become the only foreign person in the history of all US presidential elections to speak at an election rally. It has never, ever happened before. And there's eight minutes to go. I'm nervous as hell. I haven't got a clue what I'm going to say. And I perhaps might have overtrained at, at, at dinner an hour or two before. <laughs> anyway, I stand there below the podium, Trump's up there, he's going for a few minutes, he says, now they did he says, I want to introduce you to a man who against all odds. <laughs> and of course, when he says something light, he repeats it, doesn't he? <laughs> so he said it again, against and said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Nigel Farage up on the stage I go. Good evening, Mr. Sidney. That's quite a good start. They quite like that. And we're off. And it was very difficult in eight minutes to think, what blazes am I going to say? Well, of course, the big row that had been going on over those weeks, and, and despite this, Trump at that time, by the way, was 12 to 14 points behind in the polls. This was the absolute bottom, the nadir of the Trump campaign, but he just... A few days before I got to Mississippi, he just sacked the campaign manager and he put Kellyanne Conway and Steve Bannon in place. So I, was, I was fortunate to be there at the very bottom of all of this. But the story that was going around was about the financial property of the Clinton Foundation, of Bill and of Hillary, all sorts of really quite extraordinary stories. So I thought, well, I've got to get this right. I've got to get this right. So I, th I said, look, it's not for me, as a foreigner, having criticised President Obama for coming to my country and telling us how we should vote in our referendum. It wouldn't be seemly of me to say how you should vote in farce, isn't it, really? I want a Trump, Trump rally platform. <laughs> I said, but let me tell you this. I won't 
wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton if you paid me. And here was the clever bit. I then said, and I wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton if she paid me. Ah. Uh, and actually, that really worked well. I had a fantastic time. And the next day, midday, Jackson Airport, sitting in the sitting in the bar, CNN's on the monitor, and Hillary does a live press conference <laughs> to say Donald Trump has sunk to the depths. He's brought to America this misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, <laughs> racist. I forget the, 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 the length of the list. And I just thought, Hillary, thank you. You just made my future in the United States of America by putting me and what I stand for at the heart of that campaign. I can't tell you, I went back to America time and time and time again to appear on American TV as an overseas commentator, as a spinner for the Trump campaign. It wasn't always an easy thing to do. I arrived in St. Louis for the second debate to see that, that an hour before the Billy Bush tapes had come out, the grabbing tapes. The, I mean, it wasn't very easy, but I said, well, you know, he's rather like a silverback gorilla, um, an excessive alpha male with all the flaws that go with it. But I, but I stood by him all the way through. I never doubted he had a chance. And to see the faces, to see the faces of those CNN commentators, <laughs> When Pennsylvania went for Trump, they all were in But it doesn't stop there. The revolution is rolling. We now have a brand new government in Italy. Amazing what is happening there. We have elections coming up. This Things are really happening. And I say to everybody, if Brexit made you scratch your head, if Trump made you put your head in your hands, if Salvini being the Deputy Prime Minister of Italy makes you scream, let me tell you something, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> and what is it you here in Australia? Well, I have to say in Australia, what is happening in many ways mirrors much of what I've seen around the Western world. The Labour Party moves further to the left, and, and then and by the way, isn't it amazing? Only in Australia could the Conservative Party be called the Liberal Party. I'm still working on that one. <laughs> but the Labour Party... Don't, don't be too nice to your hosts. Um, the Labour Party moves to the left, and the Liberal Party here decides it can move to the centre. It can become basically a globalist social democrat party, and somehow everything is going to be okay. The fault lines of debate here are so similar to the fault lines I see elsewhere. The sovereignty question with Paris. How can it be right that a Prime Minister signs an agreement that binds successive parliaments? That bypasses the whole democratic process. The debate you're having here too on immigration and the sheer pace of it coming into this country when at one point you were the most admired country on earth in terms of how you manage immigration. And of course, the greatest rip-off of our time, which is the whole renewable energy con. <laughs> so I say to people, I say to people that if, if your Liberal Party decides it's going to stick in the centre, then don't think the big shock, don't think the big earthquake, don't think the global revolution can't come to Australia too, because it certainly can. It certainly can. And from my perspective, one of my motivations for Brexit wasn't just so that we should be a free country, the rest of Europe should be free countries, but that we should put right what we did wrong, back in 1973. I'm not somebody who's for apologies. I'm not somebody who wants to tear down statues. I'm not part of that crazy movement. But it still beggars belief that we stabbed in the back our real kith and kin, our friends in the world like you, back in 1973 by joining the common market. Despite that, despite that, there is a great love that still exists 
between Australians and British people. It is there. is the most undervalued organisation on earth. We speak English. We have a shared culture and history. We have common law. In many cases, similar contract law. There is a big exciting world for us outside the European Union. You can benefit too. We'll get our relations back on a normal track. And I look back now at what's happened over the last couple of years, and I almost have to pinch myself to think that there I was, sitting in a pub, opposite the Medal Exchange where I worked in the city back in about 1990, deciding I was going to go and take on the establishment, but wondering whether it was a bit like the charge of a light brigade. And actually, do you know what? I think I was the first person out there that helped to spark this revolution. So folks, you can protest as much as you like outside tonight. We are winning and we are happy.